sponsored by Awake Us Welcome Now. Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge, a ministry with the heart to see awakening in America. We've got a great message for you today. It's entitled, The Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now, here's Pastor Chris Dodge. Today, we're going to be talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about what are you waiting for? And we're going to look at what the scriptures have to say about the Holy Spirit's action and work and movement and purpose. Not just 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem at Shavuot, but today among followers of Jesus all over our country and all over the world. So hang on, folks. Here we go. This is good stuff. Would you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 2? We're going to start at verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Peter takes center stage now. Jesus had told Peter that after Jesus' death and after his resurrection, Peter was to encourage the others. Peter has taken to heart what Jesus said. And now, in response to the crowd's questions, Peter gets their attention. He says, listen to what I've got to say. I I have some words that I need to share with you. Here's the answer, in effect, he is saying to the questions you're asking. And then he goes on, verses 15 and 16. He says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. But then Peter goes on. He says, no, verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And what he's saying is this. This is not drunkenness, folks. This is the very thing that the prophets spoke of hundreds of years ago and predicted by the very power of the living God. Peter draws their attention back to the scriptures. He reminds them of what these devout Jewish people from all over the Middle Eastern world knew. And that is the scriptures that had proclaimed a day would come when God would move in mighty ways. People knew that when Messiah came, the world was going to change. And now Peter grips their attention. And he says, what you are witnessing today is a fulfillment of what the prophet Joel prophesied hundreds of years ago. This then is what Peter says. He quotes, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Note that. Not just a few, not just some, but all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Peter goes on. He says, even on my servants, this is what Joel is saying. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And then I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter quotes Joel, and he says, everything is changing. What God had promised has come true. In other words, the Messiah has come. Do you realize in the days before Peter spoke these words, people had seen the sun turn dark on the day that Jesus was crucified. That Passover Eve, they had seen the moon turn blood like red. And now Peter says, you are witnessing a great change. And the great change is this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all flesh. Do you realize how significant that is? You see, the Bible has been acknowledged by Jewish and Christian people throughout the ages as the word of God. Jewish people hold to the Hebrew scriptures and they have for centuries 
The Hebrew scriptures are far longer and, and far more extensive than the New Testament writings, the Greek scriptures. Here is the Old Testament in my Bible right there. You can see it makes up most of this book. The New Testament, on the other hand, is far shorter, and it covers this little bit here. But do you know how many times the term Holy Spirit is used in the entire Old Testament? Three times. Do you know how many times it's used in the New Testament? Well, you can read 90 times. You see, something dramatic has happened here. Now, some people look at that and say, the Holy Spirit is only mentioned three times in the Old Testament? No, he's actually mentioned more than that, but he's only called Holy Spirit three times. But he is referred to by other names. The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit. God's Spirit. So, do you know how many times those terms are used in the Hebrew Scriptures? By the way, Many of those same terms are used in the New Testament as well. So let's count them up. In the entire Old Testament, the Spirit of God, the Lord's Spirit, my Spirit, the Holy Spirit is mentioned a grand total of 74 times. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Counselor whom Jesus predicted, is mentioned 268 times. Dear friends, do you understand how significant this is? This is not just simply counting up words. This is recognizing what the Apostle Peter was speaking of. A new day has dawned. A new age has begun. And the age was the age that the Jewish people were longing for. It's the age of the last days. The scriptures declare that from the coming of the Messiah until his final return, the last days have begun. There is no doubt on the basis of what the Bible says that you and I are living in the last days. Many people speculate on what the last days will be like. Many people wonder what will the signs be. We talked about many of those things last week. But there's one thing that is incontrovertible. And that is the New Testament indicates that from the time Jesus came, suffered, died, and rose, the last days have begun. And we are in those last days, and they are the last days when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. That is something that is incredibly significant and incredibly important as we look at the Scriptures. Because you see, the Bible tells us that you and I are no longer to live the old way. Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. He suffered for us. He gave himself up in absolute and abject humility on the cross. He has risen from the grave. He has ascended. And he's coming back. And until he returns, he says, he is pouring out his Holy Spirit. Jesus even made this comment. He said, it's to your advantage that I leave. I have to admit, reading those words over the years, they've often caused me to scratch my head. Why would it be advantageous for us, for Jesus to leave planet Earth for a time, to withdraw his physical presence? And the answer is, when the Lord Jesus walked among us, he was, he was basically hooked in space and in time to one location. But now, with his ascension, he is pouring out the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of the living God is not confined to a single location, nor to a single person. In the last days, God says, Peter quotes the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And the Holy Spirit has been poured out. That is not simply an historic event. It is a life-changing reality. You see, we commemorate Pentecost today. Shavuot. 
but we don't look back on it as simply something that happened long ago. We recognize this is something that is taking place now. We are living in the age of the Spirit. In the Old Testament world, at the time of the Hebrew Scriptures, God's Spirit was moving. There's no denying that. God's Spirit sometimes came upon individuals for a particular task. But what the scriptures are saying is in these last days, the Holy Spirit is not confined to a few select individuals. The Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. That is what the scripture declares. And that's what Peter preached that day. And so there's an obvious question we need to ask. The question is this. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, he gives power. That's what Jesus had said. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We looked at that last week. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit gives power. The power to live for the living God. The power to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. The power to live a meaningful and significant life in a world that is decaying around us. The power to live boldly and confidently before people who are desperate and who are fearful and who are wondering where will all this lead. The Holy Spirit gives power. Now what does that power look like? Well, here again, the Bible gives us some very clear descriptions of the things that the Holy Spirit does. I'm going to highlight some of the most important ones. First of all, the Holy Spirit teaches. Jesus says he will bring to remembrance everything that I have taught you. The Holy Spirit is the one who instructs us, who who leads and directs us into a knowledge of the truth. In fact, the Bible goes so far as to say this. No one can even say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. The Holy Spirit convicts. He convicts us of sin. He convicts us of our need for Savior. He convicts us to turn our lives around in His power and do what God would have us do. The Holy Spirit dwells within That is one of the clear teachings of the New Testament scriptures. He dwells within the people of God. The Holy Spirit reveals. He reveals the things of God. Over the years, I have seen how God, through his Holy Spirit, reveals things to his people. Supernatural ways that he makes known what needs to be known at a particular time. In addition, we're told in scripture, the Holy Spirit guides us. He guides and directs our paths. When the early missionaries, as recorded in the book of Acts, went forth to proclaim the message of Jesus, they were led by the Spirit of God. And they didn't simply go wherever they wanted to go. They go where the Spirit tells them. I believe there's a lesson for us to learn there. Because in so much of the so-called Christian world today, people are planning their own views and attitudes and programs and then asking God to bless and what the Bible speaks of is God guiding in addition the Holy Spirit gives gifts that is something that is mentioned over and again in the New Testament we see it here in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit gives the gift of speaking in tongues to these believers on Pentecost We see it throughout the New Testament in Romans and 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter and elsewhere as the Bible talks about God's Spirit giving gifts to God's people. Those gifts are a multitude of gifts. And the New Testament doesn't simply give us every one of them. It just makes it clear that here are a number of them, but the Holy Spirit does amazing things. In addition, we're told the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He prays for us. At times when we are desperate, when we don't even know what to pray, Romans 8 tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for you and me with groans too deep for human utterance. 
The Holy Spirit also sanctifies. He transforms us. He renews us. The Holy Spirit changes our minds, our attitudes, and our behaviors to resemble the mind and attitude and behavior of Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that, that is powerful. So let me ask another question. Why is it that in many circles that call themselves Christian today, there is so little talk of the Holy Spirit and so little reliance on the Holy Spirit? Just a few months ago, I read an article by Anne Graham Lotz, who is the daughter, the second child of Billy and Ruth Graham. Anne Graham Lotz made this comment. She said she was 29 years old before she really began to understand the Holy Spirit. She said, basically growing up and as a young adult, her attitude was simply, well, the Holy Spirit is the one who's mentioned at the end of the service as the benediction is given in the name of the Father, Son, and as she put it, the Holy Ghost. She said it was only as a 29-year-old teaching hundreds of women the Gospel of John that she began to understand what the Holy Spirit does, that he teaches, convicts, that he dwells within, that he reveals, that he guides, that he gives gifts, that he intercedes, and that he sanctifies. So let me ask you, why is it that so many are not, as the New Testament says, Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, following the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, being guided by the Holy Spirit, being in step with the Holy Spirit. What is it that has prevented so much of God's people, such a great number of people from doing that? I believe the answer, if you boil it down, can be summed up in one word. And here's the word. Fear. I think many times people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. Ignorant, yes, but fearful, absolutely. And that includes many what we call Christian leaders. Fear of the Holy Spirit. What will happen if we start talking about the Holy Spirit? What will take place if we begin to explore what the scriptures have to say, how will people respond? What will be the result? Fear sets in and we say, oh my, I've heard, you know, some bad things could very easily happen. It might cause division. Fear often cripples us from listening to and acting upon what the Bible clearly declares. And let me just say this. Fear does not produce good theology. For those who say, oh, well, we can't go there for fear that it might not turn out well. That kind of fear does not produce good theology. Instead, what it produces is the namby-pamby powerless theology that has been so much a part of contemporary American Christianity that says, well, as long as you, you know, pray a little bit and worship a little bit and go about your life as best you can, everything's just fine. And God is saying, I have so much more for you. Fear does not lead to good theology. Fear leads to well, to a crippled theology that ignores the reality of the Holy Spirit, that may speak about the Father and his creative power and his goodness, that may speak about the love of God in Jesus Christ, God's only Son who gave himself up for us all and who has risen from the grave. But so often we stop there and the Bible does not. This is a new age. It is the age of the Spirit. And it is so important for us to not only recognize that intellectually, but act on it by faith. Because, dear friends, fear keeps us from going where God wants us to go. That has always been true. 
Right now here at Awake, we have been studying the book of Exodus. And Exodus is a fascinating book that shows how God intervenes in history. But it also shows the danger of paralyzing fear. The fear that God won't deliver. The fear that God has forsaken. The fear that God might not show up. The fear that God has led us in the wrong, wrong direction. It was fear as we continue on in the Torah and read in the book of Numbers about the way God moved through the people of Israel. It was fear that held the spies back when they went into the promised land and came back saying, it is a beautiful land, but the people who dwell there are so incredibly powerful. And it was fear that caused the Israelites to listen to 10 of the 12 rather than listening to Joshua and Caleb. They listened to the 10 other spies who said, we can't do this. And fear kept them from going into the land that God had promised to give them. Fear ended up causing them to spend another 38 years wandering in the wilderness until an entire generation had died off. Fear keeps us from going where God wants us to go. Is fear keeping you from listening to the Spirit of the living God? Is fear keeping you from exploring what the Bible really says? Not just a little Sunday school version of a few stories, but rather the heart of the New Testament scriptures, and for that matter, the Old Testament scriptures that talk about the new age that comes with Messiah, the age of the Spirit. And if you're fearful about that, I've got really good news for you. Because the Bible declares you don't have to be afraid of this. You already have it. Listen to these words. Acts 2 verse 38. This is also part of Peter's sermon. After he talks about what Joel has said. And after he goes through the Hebrew scriptures. He finally comes to this point. When people realize. When they are cut to the heart by what he has said. They say what must we do. And Peter says repent and be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins. Now let me ask you a question. Have you repented. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and believed on him? If that's true for you, then so is the next sentence. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What Peter is saying to those who have repented and been baptized into Christ and received him as Savior and Lord, he's saying the gift is already yours. In fact, that's what Jesus taught all along. He didn't say this is reserved for few. He didn't say this is reserved for super saints. He said the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all of you. In fact, Luke 11 verse 13. I love these words of Jesus because they're such a wonderful promise. He's speaking to people like you and me. People who realize we are sinners. None of us deserve anything from God other than punishment. We've committed treason against him. But God is good. God is gracious. God so loved the world he gave his only son. Not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. And so Jesus says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now the Scripture says, if you have believed, if you have repented and received Christ as Savior and been baptized into His name, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you about that gift. Have you opened it? A good gift needs to be opened. A good gift is not something you sit on the shelf. A good gift is not something you admire from a distance and never unpack. What God is saying to you and me is open the gift and just watch what he will do. 
You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Questions about the Holy Spirit? Submit your questions at our contact page of our website, awakeusnow.com. And join us again next time. Today's programming was sponsored by Awake Us Now.